On Flying Through Climate Change, please welcome Nancy Young, Vice President of Environmental Affairs at Airlines for America, here with John Donvan. Oh, hi, Nancy, and welcome. Um, um, I like the title of, of this talk, Flying Through Climate Change, because we're, we're going to uh, be extending the, the, the talk that we just heard um, to bring, it in, bring in the perspective of the, of the industry that makes its living off of flying in the sky, and the sky is where weather is happening and climate change is affecting essentially your ocean up there mm -hmm. that you have to work in. And I, what, are the, what are the immediate challenges, I just mean to operations that are presented by climate change as, as, as we're experiencing it now, and as we are experiencing it, will we experience it as the temperature continues to go up? Yeah, absolutely, great question, and thanks to JP for giving me an appetizer to build off on from that talk. Um, Weather and the climate broadly have been huge issues for aviation since the beginning of flight. And so it's something that we're very focused on. Uh, as we are facing additional climate impacts, we are upping our game on that. So some of the challenges that you're um, referencing include things like on an extremely hot day in a place that might not usually be quite so hot, you have an issue about the lift that an aircraft can get because an aircraft going down the runway displaces air, hotter air is thinner, and it's harder to get the lift to take off, for mm -hmm. example. So, so a heavy enough plane on a hot enough day would not be able really to get off the ground safely. That's right, and you, you saw some of that, for example, in Phoenix a couple years back, um, and it's predicted that cities that are typically pretty warm but will have those kinds of temperatures because of uh, changing climate um, will have more infrastructure issues that they have to deal with. Now, you can deal with something like that. One, safety is always number one in aviation. So you're not going to fly if you're not able to meet all the safety parameters, and there are significant margins for error built in there. So mm -hmm. there, it's always going to be safe. The things that you can do, you can reduce the weight of the aircraft. Um, the aircraft manufacturers are increasingly building and certifying aircraft to be able to handle um, those higher temperatures. So and planes are being designed with climate change in mind. Well, they've always been, they've always been designed with temperature in mind. Right? Yeah, yeah. So think about we have to be able to operate at 36,000 feet in the icy, icy cold, mm -hmm. and you need to come down, say, to the desert if you're going to the Middle East or even in the U.S. in, in a hotter climate. So aircraft manufacturers have always designed to that but the parameters of that and the certification then of the aircraft and the operating parameters of those aircraft and those temperatures have to be adjusted. And those get put across both in the aircraft and then in sort of the operating protocols for what you do with the aircraft in terms of the weight it can take, the length of the runway it needs yeah. to take off, et cetera. And I, and I don't wanna make this sound like it's happening everywhere. I mean, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, lots of cold, lots of warm there, for example, we're not seeing the extremes everywhere, but in certain types of right. climates, you, you would need to take this into account. So we're, we're all accustomed to the idea that when there are thunderstorms or blizzards, the airport's gonna have to shut down. But you're also talking about a world in which just high temperatures could mean that an airport has to shut down or slow down a lot. Well, yeah, I mean, I think uh, like the Phoenix example, it was really just a slowdown. And in fact, it didn't affect every aircraft. Yeah. A number of aircraft, in fact, some of the biggest aircraft were certified to operate in those conditions without a problem. So you really have to look at the fact that different aircraft are flying in a, in a given airport. And I, and I don't want to overblow that, but I think, okay. I think the point is, and, and you mentioned, you know, winter weather, for example, again, uh, we work very, very closely with the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. Their National Weather Service actually has an aviation weather center, for example. And our own um, airlines have operations centers, and FAA has a command center, and they all interconnect with this information about weather. So we're getting real-time information as well as predictive information and feeding that into our operations. So if it's winter weather, if it's warmer weather, um, we're, we're adjusting to that. But system-wide, I think you've heard in the panels today, we're all looking at what does a changing climate mean over the long run, and how do you design to that, how do you operate to that? And that's just 
in a way, kind of business as usual for the airlines since we've always had that yeah. as a big factor for us. Let's talk a little bit about carbon emissions. Yeah. So here's an interesting thing. that the, the challenges that you're facing in the sky results somewhat significantly from the rise in carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. The airline industry puts carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. just curious. Uh, I'm looking for interesting guesses. So if you, don't, if you actually know the answer, that would be less interesting. I'm just want the <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just being honest about it. Um, what percentage of global carbon emissions do you, would you estimate comes from the airline industry? Um, I can do a raise, show of hands. 1%? 10%? 20%? Higher than 20 Okay, so we've covered the range. It's, it's actually only 2.5% which I, I found quite surprising. It's a small fraction, but 2.5% is still 2.5%. And that, that comes to almost a billion metric tons, according to the Council on Clean Energy Transportation, which is also saying that, that the rate of carbon emissions contributed by airlines is going up at a really fast pace. It's up 32% since 2013. Yeah, and so the, that's a challenge. What's going on there? Yeah, well, first, let me... Do you challenge the numbers Let, let me put or? those um, numbers in context, number one. I mean, let's... And, uh, and I'll use a U.S. example, for sure. example. In the United States, the Environmental Protection C Agency confirms that U.S. airlines are 2% of our nation's greenhouse gas emissions inventory. Mm -hmm. So we'll look at that, and we can talk about the global, too. They're, sure. they're certainly related. So globally, as John says, 2.5% of all the world's airlines operating around there. So... Um, we have really been focused forever, kind of like we've been focused forever on safety and weather, we've been focused on fuel efficiency. And so that's why if you think about the U.S. airlines, we move 2.4 million passengers on average a day, 58,000 tons of cargo on average a day. We drive 5% of the GDP and we're 2% of the nation's greenhouse gas emissions. Now to the point about emissions growth, um, People want to fly, they want to ship things. Now we've improved in the United States our fuel efficiency as US airlines 130% since 1978. So what, what does that mean? That means we saved 5 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide, roughly equivalent to taking 26 million cars off of the road, road each year since 1978. So that's how you're 2% of, of the greenhouse gas emissions driving 5% of GDP. Concern. Growth, yeah. right? So one, I don't agree with the ICCT numbers, but yes, there is the potential for uh, emissions growth. And the way that the industry has been addressing that, not just the airlines, but working with the airports, the airframe and engine manufacturers, and the air navigation service providers, is to set a series of climate targets. The first one was an annual average fuel efficiency improvement of 1.5% beginning in 2009 to 2020, we're exceeding that, we're at 2.3%. So you, you know, the fuel efficiency is there, the growth is there, but we are, we've outstripped the growth of emissions from the growth of aviation, so that's a good thing. Our second target is carbon neutral growth from 2020, meaning beginning in 2021, we're gonna hold the growth of those carbon emissions constant. In other words, we're not going to grow those emissions. So uh, we get the concern very much that people have that if there is emissions growth, we could take more than that 2% of the carbon budget. And 2% isn't nothing, right? You need to actually, all of us in a carbon constrained world need to decrease. Mm -hmm. So we're going we're gonna to take growth off the table. And then in, we have a, a goal of a 50% net reduction in carbon dioxide in 2050. And we're working earnestly towards that through an array of measures, which I'm happy to talk about. JP gave you a, a hint or two. So, but what, what I think I hear you saying is that one of the reasons that the amount of carbon emissions put out by airline, the airline industry is going up is because more of us are flying, that there, there's just more aviation than there used to be. Can I do one more flash poll of the audience? Just raise your hand if you've been on an airplane in the air within the last month or plan to within the coming month. Shame on you. <laughs> no, me too. And I, but I, I bring up the shame question because there actually is kind of, uh, the, the, um, you know, this, the, the Swedes have now yeah. come up with this term, fliegskam, which, mm -hmm. which means shame of flying. And there's this move towards uh, the Green Party in Germany is saying, 
let's, let's stop the internal domestic flights inside Germany and go by train. What, what do you think of these, do you think that the, the, this argument is realistic to, to get everybody in the room to not, and the, to not want to fly anymore domestically when there's an alternative? Is that a, is that a serious avenue to pursue? Well, I, I mean, I think we respect that people have a concern about emissions, emissions growth, and yeah. are thinking about the things to do about that. And I, I, one of the things that, you know, we, we, we don't think the flying shame movement is right. We think it's misplaced, but one of the kind of perverse thing it's, things it's done is given us a chance to talk about our record. Like, you just ask the audience, how much CO2 do we put out? We haven't really gotten to, are you doing much about that besides that. your targets? But yeah. uh, So I will do that. But people ha don't really know all of those things, and, and maybe in part it was because we were small. Mm. People were really focused on power plants and automobiles. I mean, automobiles in the United States, uh, just the cars themselves are 17%. And when you add the rest of transportation, not with us, there's a, it adds to 26%. Well, may I pause you for just a second, just to tell the audience if you want to send in some questions now, uh, you can start and okay. let's talk about that. Then. Yeah. Well, uh, let's talk about what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I can give you the, the goals that we have, but what we're really doing is driving technology, operations and infrastructure. And as JP mentioned, we're changing our fuel dynamic, and I'm really proud of the fact that we're leading that effort as industry by developing and deploying sustainable aviation fuels. And then you ask this question, while we fly from country to country, what are you gonna do? You hear things about carbon offsets, you hear things about emissions trading or carbon taxes. Um, what we did is worked for several years with the governments under our, um, body, the United Nations body that sets our standards, the International Civil Aviation, to come up with two agreements on climate action. One, a carbon dioxide standard for future aircraft that goes into effect in 2020, mm -hmm. and the carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation, the acronym is CORSIA, mm -hmm. and that is part of how we're going to meet this carbon neutral growth from 2020 goal. In 2021, this offsetting system kicks in. So we're gonna keep driving through technology, lighter aircraft, more efficient aircraft, as JP mentioned, every, every generation is about 15 to 20% more fuel efficient, and aircraft engines like the geared turbofan that Pratt & Whitney UTC developed help us do that. The winglets you see on the end of our planes, when you see them tip up, they bring aerodynamics from three to 6% um, improvement. So more fuel efficiency. The infrastructure, I think, is a big thing. And JP was mentioning a bit of that, that interconnectivity of information. We've got a challenge in the United States. We have had an opportunity to tra transition to a modernized air traffic management system over the last many years from the radar-based system. And because of a number of bureaucratic and structural issues, our government that controls the air traffic management system has not been able to implement that fully. Well, if they did, the original estimate was we would get about 12% emission savings. There's that inefficiency in the system you would gain through modernization. But the inspector general confirms that that hasn't happened. So we're trying to work very closely with FAA and Congress to get that program going. So as you mentioned the FAA, I mean, we're in a period now after, after Boeing's recent safety scandals, there's there's, there's been a lot of questioning about whether deregulation of the airline industry went too far. Those sorts of things may not have happened if the regulations had been in place. And I want to bring that question to the issue of, uh, of, of climate mitigation and the airlines. And the airlines spend a, lot of, a, a great deal of, of lo money lobbying Congress, so it has influenced six and a half million dollars last year. And the question is, and everything that we're talking about, is there a place for the FAA or some other federal agency to be involved in setting rules and regulations, tighter rules and regulations for the airline industry in terms of climate emissions, in carbon emissions? Oh, absolutely. In fact, we work very closely with them and they actually already do regulate us. So let me give a couple of examples. Well, one, let's talk about what you do without regulation. So when I talked about sustainable aviation fuels in 2006, FAA, my organization, Airlines for America, 
the Aerospace Industries Association and the airports banded together to create the Commercial Aviation Alternative Fuels Initiative. That's a public-private initiative. And why did we do that? Because everybody focused on ground-based alternative fuels forever. In fact, back in the 70s, that started being subsidized. Well, nobody was focusing on this, so we had to create that industry. So working with our government, we've done things like that. FAA has the Continuous Lower Energy Emissions and Noise Program, another public-private program that we and the manufacturers participate to advance technology and operations. To the regulation side, FAA itself is the one that's implementing for U.S. airlines and business jet operation operators the Carbon Offsetting Reduction Scheme for International Aviation. I mentioned that it was agreed internationally by 193 countries by treaty the United States has stayed in that agreement. You think about the United States stepping away from Paris Agreement, we've stayed in the Corsia Agreement, and FAA is implementing it. So yeah, there's certainly a role. I should also mention But that more, I'm actually asking more of a role. I mean, are you? Yeah, well, I'll give another example. The Environmental Protection Agency under the Clean Air Act has the authority and, in fact, has set a number of regulations for oxides of nitrogen, carbon monoxide, particulate matter, et cetera, from aircraft. Right now, they are poised to adopt the carbon dioxide certification standard that I mentioned was agreed at the international level in 2016. So there are things that they can do to overlay a carbon offsetting scheme through FAA, EPA adopting the internationally agreed standard for aircraft, and, and interestingly, industry wants these things to happen because our environmental interests in avoiding and minimizing climate impacts. You would gain too. We need to contribute to that, right? We need to contribute to the climate <laughs> mitigation issues, number one. We also have an economic incentive in reducing fuel burn. It's the number one or number two cost for airlines in any given year, and they compete with each other on routes. So the more fuel efficient you are, hence the more carbon efficient you are, the better you're gonna do. It's a very interesting paradox and one we're all going to be thinking about as we all certainly continue to fly. Nancy, thank you so much thank for you, joining Sean. us.